All right, so we are into section 7.2. You know, it's always my nightmare that one that I record something or I take a bunch of time to record it, and then at the end, I don't get to use it. But I'm hoping I don't need to get to that point. So we shall, uh, let's move on. Transformation. So we are going to apply basically everything we learned in chapter one and now apply it to exponential graphs. So let's, let's do this. So we are going to see the different characteristics of exponentials. Ooh, that sounds familiar. We're going to continue in that from last time. We are going to graph exponential equations with an abundance of transformations. And we are going to solve an exponential word problem. Everybody's favorite. Everyone loves a good word problem. So here we go. Just as a reminder, we've got two types of exponential graphs. We've got growth, where c is greater than 1. We've got decay, where is c is between 0 and 1. We've got c cannot equal 1, and it has to be greater than 0, so no negatives. And we've got these asymptotes at y equals 0, meaning my graph gets really close to that point, but never actually touches it. So how else does the base affect the graph? As uh, this base, C, gets closer to 1, the curve is going to flatten out. That's, that's, at least for this class, that's essentially what we're going to consider with that. The base is not what's going to change in our, in our equation. Just like when we talked about uh, having the original function is x squared in chapter 1. We never change that to x cubed, or x to the power of 5. We would never do that, so when we change what our, our graph looks like or change the equation, we're not going to touch that base. Consider that the original. So here's a few equations for um, y being greater than 1, or x, sorry, the c being greater than 1. Notice we started off with 2, it's higher up, then it goes down, 1.2, 1.1, and as I get closer and closer to 1, it's going to start to become an equal line. We can also look at c between 0 and 1. Same thing. 0 0.5 to the power of x is higher than as I get closer and closer to 1. 0 0.8, 0 0.9, that gets closer to 1. It starts to become a level line. So that's what that looks like. Let's look at the generic function. So remember this. y equals a f. f is just a generic function b, x minus h, plus k. All of these are transformations we are now going to apply to an exponential graph. For exponentials, f of x is going to now become c to the power of x. So when we combine these, it looks like this. y equals a, so the vertical stretch and reflection goes in front of the function, then I replace f with now my function c to the power of this b x minus h, and then outside of the exponent plus k. So this is what we're going to deal with. And reminders what each of these are. a is the vertical stretch and or reflection. b is the horizontal stretch and reflection. h, horizontal translation, left and right. And k, vertical. Up, down. c is the base. Again, that's not going to change as we go through the transformations. Describe the transformations on the following equation and give the order. This should be very familiar. Here's an equation. We need to say what each of these numbers are doing to my original graph. My original graph is 1 over 2 to the power of x. So the 1 over 2 is just the base. That actually doesn't affect anything. So we got the negative 3 up front. That's my vertical reflection and vertical expansion by factor of 3. We've got 0 0.5 here is a horizontal expansion by 2. The minus 2 up there, I'm moving horizontally to the right through uh, 2. And vertically up by 4. So that's the transformations. The ordering for this, same as before. Pick horizontals or pick verticals, do those first, and then do the other. You know me, verticals are my go-to. So vertical reflection expansion is number one, vertical translation two, horizontal expansion three, 
Horizontal Translation 4. There's your ordering. Now we're going to graph. There's a couple ways we're going to do this. So we want to graph this. I'm going to show you the first method here. So what we're doing is we're looking at how does my original graph, 4 to the power of x, change. I've got a horizontal reflection and horizontal compression by 2. I move left 5 and I move down 3. Looking at the ordering, here we do horizontals first and then verticals. So in order to do this, what I'm going to do is look at what is the original function. Just like we would take a look at x squared originally, or we'd look at absolute value of x originally and translate those points, I'm going to do the same thing here. So take my basic graph, 4 to the power of x. We are going to plug in random x values. Doesn't matter what you do, plug them into that equation. You get these y values. So here are three points on the original graph. I'm going to transform them using these different transformations. So here we go. Here's my original points. I just changed 1 over 4 to equal 0 0.25. It makes it look a little bit nicer without the fractions. First, we're going to do the horizontal reflection and compression. So take my x values for each of these points, and we are going to divide by negative 2. So notice the y values don't change. I am dividing the x by negative 2. Then we'll do the horizontal translation. So take the x, subtract 5 from each of these values of x. The y's again stay the same. Then the vertical translation 3 down. So I take each of the y values and minus 3. So here's going to be the new point that we're going to put on the graph. So I'm going to move to the next one. I'll write those three points out again, those exact same ones. Here's the equation. Here are the points that we got at the end of that last slide. So plot them. It looks like this. So it's going to take a little bit of practice with these points to be able to recognize what the graph looks like. So you'll need to get a gist of what does an exponential graph look like in order to be able to graph from just a few points. So something like this, remember our exponential has some sort of a horizontal asymptote. So when I connect the dots, it's going to look like this. Now it might be confusing to figure out where is that horizontal asymptote. Why don't I curve this down and the asymptote's at minus four? Or why is it not at minus 5? So this comes from where my vertical or translation is. Whatever the vertical translation is, that's where my new asymptote is. So here, at the end of the equation, we had y, uh, da, 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 whatever, minus 3. Minus 3 means my asymptote goes from 0 to, down to 3. So that's to help you figure out where that asymptote is. So even before you start plotting things, you already know what that is. And once you have the asymptote, all you need to figure out is it growth or decay, and is it above the asymptote or below. Those are the only things you really need. Now, there's an alternate method for this. It's easier in some sense and more difficult in some sense. So I'll show you what this is. Basically, all you're going to do is make a table of values but instead of looking at the original function, you just use this new function. So we plot out some points. Here's x, y. And we plot in x equals negative 1 into this equation. Plug it into your calculator. You get this. Take x equals 0. You get this. Take 1, 2, negative 2, negative 3. Notice this doesn't help us. And this is the downfall of this kind of a graph, um, or this method, is you might need to try a lot of points. So I tried those, those don't make sense. So we make another table of values. Plug in x equals negative 4. Okay, now we're getting into a new number, negative 2.94. Negative 5 gives us negative 2. Okay, now we're actually getting somewhere. So plotting those dots, I get something that looks like this. From there, you could be able to sketch the rest, but for me, who likes to be um, 
particular and exact point. I did some decimals in here and notice I got some exact values. So I was able to make an exact graph from all these points. So this is easier in one sense because you don't need to translate an original function. You can just simply make a table of values from this origin or from this translated function and plot it. So whichever method you want to use, both will get you full marks. There'll be no issue with that. The other one though does help with um, fully understanding what the transformations do. This is just your dummy calculating something into a calculator, but without really understanding it. But that doesn't mean that you can't do this to double check or to, to solve the number. Just the other one is um, helps you understand what you're doing. Okay, word problem. They're going to come up. It's going to come on the test. Just accept it. So we've got an element that has a half-life of 720, 720, I don't know where the 7 came from, 520 years. There is 100 grams initially. So we want to do a few things. Determine the equation, describe what each of the numbers and variables mean in that equation. We want to figure out how much of the element remains after 40 years, and we want to know what's the time it takes to get to 40 grams. First, let's determine the equation. So recall, here is the generic equation I will give you. So we need to put in numbers for this. Um, what do we got? P initial is 100 because we're told the original amount. R is negative a half because we're diminishing by a half. And N is 520. So the time it takes to do the half-life. So here's your equation. Or, you, because I used P and T in here, this is kind of the generic way to do it. You can also see it with Y and X. Since you'll probably be graphing at some point, you might as well get used to flipping these as well. P and T, Y and X, same thing. It's all a relationship between variables. So we want to describe what each of the numbers mean. So in this, this is your original equation. Remember, P equals the future population of whatever this element is. 100 is my initial population, 0 0.5 is the base, and it's the percentage that's remaining from my 100% of what I started with. T is time, in this case it's years, because you're told 720 years. 720, why am I saying 720? I don't know where I get that from. 520, and 520 is the half-life time, the amount of time to reduce your population by a half, is 520 years. So at the end of 520 years, I will have 50 grams. Then in another 520 years, I'm gonna have 25. And then 12 and a half. And then six and a quarter-ish. And then whatever. But every 520 years, you get half of what you started with at the beginning of that time. How many elements remain after 40 years? So this is pretty straightforward. We take our equation, plug in T, which is 40, and we get that we have 94.8 grams. This is just plug it into your calculator. Good to go. Plug and chug, as I like to say. All right, how long will it take for only 40 grams to remain? So this is the future value. So P equals 40, and now we're gonna solve for T. So do a little bit of algebra, get to this point. Now at this point, we're going to try different t values. So just try some out. Let's say t equals 100. I get 0 0.875. Too big. Pick another number. 600. 0 0.449. I'm getting closer. 687. I get exactly the right number. So t equals 687. I know what the right answer should be. So this didn't take too many tries. But you're going to try and get around that point. So as long as you're close to within a few decimals, like 4.01, 4.09, something like that, then it should be, then it's okay. If the number is big like this. That's it. That's 7.2. So that is the end of that. We're going to carry on to the next section, uh, which is the last section, in a little bit.
All right, so again, like I've said, I got new people who are gonna come in to explain some things to you. So let's uh, let's bring in the, the next one. And this one's going to be, I forgot their name. Singing Sam, I believe is the next one. So let me go get him. Why hello there, so I'm Singing Sam. I'm gonna try and convince you to uh, give our buddy Mr. Brandon Cleland a good subscribe, a little bit of liking for his videos. Let's we'll see how this goes. I got a couple of tunes. to subscribe and like Mr. Brandon's videos. I think he'd really appreciate it if you did what you were asked and hit the like and the bell. Just do it right now. What are you waiting for? Just do it. So if that one didn't convince you, let's see if uh, let's see if this one does. Maybe this one's more to your liking. I know you want to subscribe. I know you want to like all his videos All his videos Then you will feel so good Like you've accomplished something with your life With your life 